Yes, this is uh, the first time that we are having an early morning session, so I hope it works well for everyone. And it's also worked as an alarm clock, which gets you up and awake in the morning and also gets you energetic and get going, gives you that push start, that kick start for the rest of the day. So yes, this is uh, planned for the entire week. In this week, we are going to meet every day in the morning at 8 o'clock. For this session, it's going to be a short 20-25 minute session where we are going to talk about exactly 5 MCQs which you will be solving for me, followed by 3 images which I've got as spotters. And at the end, just to end the session, I'll share with you two revision, mnemonics, uh, revision of two mnemonics, so that on the whole, you've learned 10 things to start your or begin your day with. So yes, very good morning to everyone. For those who don't know, this is the schedule that we are following and uh, which clearly tells you that uh, we'll be meeting daily at uh, 8.30, this particular, 8 o'clock at this particular uh, time slot in the morning on YouTube, 8 o'clock. And in the evening, today onwards, we are also meeting at 5.30 and these are the topics that we are going to have a quiz on. These are free classes for all of you. So today at 5.30, we have a general pathology quiz, which uh, is a mixed bag of all the general path chapters that we've had, be it genetics, pedigree or immunology or cell injury, inflammation, giant cells. So it's a good mixed bag that you've got to practice. And we'll be meeting again at 5.30 today itself. Okay, so for those who don't know, we have a course starting on January 15th, which is a NEAT PG course that is for the plus students of a total of 72 hours. And for the FMG students, we have a course of micro in March and of pathology in the month of April. Okay, so let's begin with our five MCQs, guys. Um, I'll put up an MCQ quickly, give me an answer. We'll do a one slide description and we'll move forward. Okay, so let's begin. Number one, this is question number one is in two parts. This is the first part of that question. Broken heart syndrome is classified under which type of cardiomyopathy? Dilative, restrictive, constrictive or none of the above? Broken heart syndrome. Not a very good thing to start your day with. Uh, but yes, that's our question. So we'll have to take it. Everyone, I expect a good answer. Majority of you say uh, dilated. Some of you say restrictive. Okay, no. Uh, majority of you are right. Broken heart syndrome is a type of dilated. It's a type. It's not entirely similar to dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a type of dilated cardiomyopathy known as Tacot subo cardiomyopathy. So broken heart syndrome is the same as Tacot subo cardiomyopathy. So what do you see in this? So as we say, Tacot subo cardiomyopathy is the broken heart syndrome. So basically, because of a heartbreak, that is how it has been defined. Because of a heartbreak, there is a lot of stress. Okay, so same goes for exam time, same goes for any other situation in life. Heartbreaks are actually not that severe. So uh, any stressful condition in life when there's a lot of stress and a lot of catecholamines are being released, that is when the patient can suffer from Tacot Subo Cardiomyopathy. That is why you call it broken heart syndrome that refers to the stress. Broken heart refers to the stress. Okay, why do you call it Tacot Subo? Okay, Tacot Subo is a Japanese pot in which we catch the octopus. I'll show you a picture. It's a Japanese pot in which uh, they use it to catch the octopus. And that is how your left ventricle of the patient starts looking. So which part of the heart is dilated? See, it's a type of car dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, in dilated cardiomyopathy, all the four chambers are dilated. All four chambers. Whereas in broken heart syndrome, only the left ventricle is dilated. That's the difference. Only left ventricle. Let me show you a quick picture. So if this is the normal left ventricle. Can you see what is happening in Tacot Subo cardiomyopathy? It's becoming globular. Only the left ventricle. It's becoming globular like an octopus spot. So this is that octopus spot that we are talking about, which we call as Tacot Subo, which is the Japanese, catching, Japanese octopus catching pot. So yes, guys. Question was, Tacot Subo is which type of uh, cardiomyopathy? It's a type of DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. One more question. The second part of the first question. Hereditary hemochromatosis predominantly produces which type of cardiomyopathy? Predominantly, you know, it's a mixture. It can produce uh, two types of cardiomyopathies. I'm asking you the predominant form out here. 
ओके सो मीन वाइल डॉक्टर खेमेश्वर सेज दैट मैम डी सी एम इज ऑल्सो बिकॉज ऑफ टाइट एंड म्यूटेशन एक्सिलेंट डायलेटेड कार्डियोमायोपैथी इज बिकॉज ऑफ टाइट एंड म्यूटेशन यू आर राइट ऑन ट्रैक कम ऑन हेरिडिट्री हिमोक्रोमोटोसिस परफेक्ट Uh, as I said, it's a combination, na. So many of you are having a confusion between A and C, between dilated and restrictive. There is a confusion. I don't blame you guys because it can show you both. But what did I ask you? Which is the predominant? So see, if you were selecting a multiple choice question, A and C both are right. But if you have to go for a predominant type, then it is very good, Doctor Sabir. It is DCM more than restrictive cardiomyopathy. So if you have to select one, then go for dilated. If you have an option of selecting both, go for restrictive. A controversial question. I hope you've got that right. Hereditary hemochromatosis. Coming to question number two, a little lengthy. Let's start reading. We have a twenty-year-old previously healthy athlete who suffers a sudden cardiac arrest while playing a sport. On autopsy, there is myocardial hypertrophy without ventricular dilatation. Microscopy shows myofiber disarray and interstitial fibrosis, which is the most likely diagnosis. Most likely diagnosis. perfect perfect it's a classical case this is just to share with you the case so that i can share the pictures of the case with you see what were the takeaway points over here young athlete 20 year old young athlete sudden death that is the classical history they will give to you sudden death in a young athlete is indicative of nothing but hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy further what was the hint microscopic appearance myofiber disarray i'm going to show you a picture before that before that dilated nahi hai because very clearly examiner has told me without ventricular dilation okay second amyloidosis what kind of cardiomyopathy does amyloidosis result in what kind of cardiomyopathy for amyloidosis guys for amyloidosis it is it's actually one of the most common causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy one of the most common causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy is amyloidosis this is not the case this is a case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy so remember hocm that was the next question i wanted to ask you which is the most common mutation you see in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy it is beta mhc beta myosin heavy chain most common mutation of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy number 1 obviously you see hypertrophy who will tell me hypertrophy of what of the entire heart of all the chambers of a particular portion hypertrophy of what i hope you remember hypertrophy of interventricular septum interventricular septum yes i can see those answers coming in interventricular septum is hypertrophied because of which your heart starts looking like a banana shaped heart so what is the gross finding before i show you a picture banana shaped heart and what is the microscopic finding which was given to you disarray everything is haphazard all fibers of the muscle of the cardiac muscle they've gone here and there let me show you a picture so over here if we try to highlight can you see this left ventricular cavity this left ventricular cavity has become banana shaped left ventricular cavity has become banana shaped so number 1 point banana shaped heart in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy how will the microscopy be like this can you see okay cardiac muscle fiber this one going like this then you have a diagonal then this one going diagonally again diagonally again diagonally so they are basically going in any random direction this one's almost becoming horizontal almost becoming horizontal so that is what you can call either you can call it as a disarray or we also call it as a helter skelter appearance i hope this is clear all these points put together you've got a young athlete sudden death no dilation hypertrophy in which beta myosin heavy chain is is defective banana shaped heart and myocardial disarray that is your classical case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy coming to the next question guys all our causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy except now i'm asking you causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy 
all except, come on, you know this, radiation, fibrosis, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, alcoholism. Many of you were answering this, answering this earlier. So I kind of ignored your comments that time because I knew that if I answer, I will give away one question of the day. So I think all of you know this. Perfect. See, so I think everyone's um, definitely up and awake. I have um, definitely worked as a good uh, you know, a wake up alarm for all of you today. Yes, all our causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy except alcohol. Alcohol causes DCM. It's one of the very, very common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. Whereas all the others, that is fibrosis, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis or any kind of infiltrative disorder, any kind of infiltrative disorder, for that matter, even hemochromatosis, Second option is hemochromatosis causing restrictive, most common is dilated. But yes, any infiltration of which amyloid is going to be the most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So tomorrow in the kickstart morning, I'll have a question on cardiac amyloidosis and let's see how many of you will read and come and get that right. Tomorrow's first question will be cardiac amyloidosis. Okay, so all of these cause restrictive, but alcohol causes dilated. So can you tell me in restrictive, what is getting restricted? Is it uh, the systolic function that is going, going to be problematic or diastolic function that is going to be problematic? Yes, everyone. So, what is getting problematic? What is dysfunction? Which dysfunction? Excellent. It's a diastolic dysfunction that is going to happen. There is a diastolic dysfunction that is going to happen, right? All of these, okay, one of you says, ma'am, all cis causes, okay, good. Fibrosis, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, great, good mnemonic, all of these cause restrictive. Alcoholism causes dilated. Coming to question number four. Which type of restrictive heart condition occurs commonly in the first two years of life and as a result of exposure to mumps? I think I've given you three very, very important hints. Restrictive card cardiomyopathy, young child less than two years of age, mumps exposure. This is something that a student had posted on my telegram two or three weeks back. So I thought I'll discuss it out here. Okay, as I see... As I see, great, all of you, uh, I've just got five, six answers only. But yes, uh, those five, six answers are right. It is, okay, so uh, the major confusion, most of you say it is endocardial fibroelastosis. Most of you say it is endocardial fibroelastosis. Some of you say endomyocardial fibrosis. See, they roughly sound pretty much the same. But what was the, uh, you know, what was the history that I've given to you? First and foremost, restrictive heart condition. Let me tell you, endomyocardial fibrosis, Loeffler's endomyocarditis, endocardial fibroelastosis. All of these are causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So any of them could have been the answer. Then what is my next hint? First two years of life. If you've got a less than two year old child and they give you a classical history of a viral infection like mumps, this child is going to suffer from endocardial fibroelastosis. So there's going to be fibrous tissue. There's going to be elastic tissue that is going to lay down in the endocardium. Fibrous tissue and elastic tissue. Okay, so less than two years of age with mumps history. If not mumps history, uh, any mutation they could have told you for endomyocardial fibrosis, any mutation they could have told you that, okay, this gene is mutated. That gene mutation is not specific, but it can be seen in a lot of cancers all over the body, a lot of heart conditions it can be seen in. So, uh, yes, I'll explain the others also. But tell me, what mutation can you see with endocardial fibroelastosis? Dr. Kameshwar, you're right, viral to hai, mumps association hai. I'm asking you for the gene mutation. What gene? It's a gene, I'll give you another hint. It's a gene that you have in the cardiac muscle. You also have it in the skeletal muscle. It is the... Some call it TAS, it is Tefazin gene mutation. Some call it TAS, it is the Tefazin gene mutation. So yes, a lot of cancers have reported this. So in the heart, endocardial fibroelastosis has reported it. Okay, what about the others? Endomyocardial fibrosis, this one. All those who said this one, this is seen in adults. This is seen in adolescents, adults. This is not seen in children. 
okay so immediately you should have ruled out second loffler's endomyocarditis as soon as you hear the word loffler the cell that should come to your mind that i should have mentioned should be eosinophils yes many of you answered it correctly dr ritwik dr khemeshwar good loffler's will have increase in the eosinophils eosinophils so that is again something that i have not mentioned so this was the classical case guys classical endocardial fibroelastosis restrictive heart condition hai less than 2 years of age mumps patient coming to the last mcq for the day then we have three images and two mnemonics quickly 35 year old woman with a mild chest pain has a mid systolic click followed by a late systolic murmur there is no history of rheumatic heart disease which of the following is histopathology of the mitral valve more likely to show you got degenerative calcific deposits myxomatous degeneration lymphocytes and macrophages fibrin inflammatory cells and bacteria if you've read the first line well you know the answer okay great i've got um 10 answers on the whole okay many more pouring in everyone knows this great so what disease are we talking about everyone saying ma'am answer is b myxomatous degeneration yes it's a case of mitral valve prolapse it's a case of mitral valve prolapse so what was the hint that i had over here 35 year old woman because mitral valve prolapse is very commonly seen in females who have very minor symptoms or are usually asymptomatic mild chest pain or usually asymptomatic they'll come to you with some other complaint other than the chest other than the heart and they come to you and when you auscultate you find a mid systolic click classical history of a mitral valve prolapse so what do you see also known as the uh, floppy valve because the valve is prolapsed it becomes floppy and also known as barlow syndrome so as i said usually very minor symptoms or asymptomatic usually females usually has a mid systolic click and when i look at this mitral valve under the microscope remember mitral valve prolapse shows me myxomatous degeneration guys make it a rule in the heart okay in the heart if you see the word myxomatous written you only have to think of two things one is myxomatous degeneration of the valve so that should call you towards mitral valve prolapse and any tumor all of you know any tumor you know other if the word myxomatous material is written and they are talking about a tumor it's the most common benign tumor of the heart myxoma so the word myxomatous should always immediately make two differentials in your mind and work out on your way either it is myxomatous degeneration of the valve and mitral valve prolapse or it is the most common cardiac tumor that is myxoma quickly tell me what is the most common site of a myxoma most common site atrial myxoma as uh, dr lazy bones said oh says it okay myxoma atrial most commonly i'll add to that left atria i'll add left atria to that okay okay so great we've done this i'll just quickly show you a picture of a mitral valve prolapse just in case they give you uh, you know the gross finding so one thing that is very very characteristic of a mitral valve prolapse is hooding or ballooning okay so what you see over here like this what you see over here it in a case of mitral valve prolapse is ballooning or hooding that is something which is very very characteristic are we clear let me quickly have a look at the other options baki options mein likha tha that there is no history of rheumatic heart disease and what are the other options degenerative calcific deposits no it can't be because calcification will be seen in rheumatic heart disease which type of calcification uh, will i see dystrophic or will i see metastatic which type of calcification dystrophic or metastatic we see we see the classical dystrophic calcification we see the classical dystrophic calcification then lymphocytes macrophages inflammatory cells bacteria no none of these are seen in mitral valve prolapse inflammation calcification would have been seen in rheumatic heart disease and examiner has told you no history of rheumatic heart disease all these calcification inflammation things ruled out classical case of mitral valve prolapse female asymptomatic mid systolic click okay mitral valve prolapse can you tell me any syndrome with which i'll give you a hint it's a very very tall patient extremely tall patient he has extremely long fingers spider fingers and in that patient the cardiac condition is mitral valve prolapse 
very very tall patient spider fingers mitral valve prolapse i think everyone knows m for m again marfan syndrome marfan syndrome one more guys uh, it's a male patient it's a male patient again extremely tall male patient and that patient has hypogonadism hypogonadism the testicular size is small again very very tall patient male patient particularly male patient very tall hypogonadism cardiac condition is this amazing kleinfelter yes so mitral valve prolapse is seen associated with kleinfelter and marfan's that is also a question that you have to know okay guys we are done with our uh, five mcqs of the day and now we start with quick three identification of images two mnemonics and done we are pretty much on time it's 22 minutes so i told you it will be a kick start within 25 minutes we'll be done yes guys what is this picture no history given to you but something with an arrow something with an arrow some cell which is showing you this kind of a cytoplasm it's got a flare yes excellent excellent it's got a flare it's got a flare to it it is the what cell great everyone knows it so that flare is like a skirt it's like a skirt it is the ballerina skirt appearance it's the ballerina skirt appearance that you see with epstein barr virus infection known as downy cell so can you all see the skirting of the cytoplasm in this way yes that is the downy cell that you see in a epstein barr virus basically basically a case of infectious mononucleosis you can say infectious mononucleosis everyone knows it very very good okay so this is image number 1 what about image number 2 i've got you um, you know a small question also identify this testicular tumor i've got you the gross and i've got you this microscopy tell me is it a ledic cell seminoma corio carcinoma or an embryonal cell carcinoma ledic seminoma corio or embryonal cell quite a spotter and if you've got second year students you have to be on track with this amazing amazing so let's decode the picture answer to this question seminoma why is it a seminoma let me first look at the gross when i look at the gross it's got a characteristic cut potato appearance cut potato appearance and it is homogeneous when i say homogeneous from here till here everywhere in this tumor i see one color one appearance are you seeing areas of red hemorrhage or yellow color necrosis any any different different areas no all of the area looks the same it looks like a potato cut potato cut potato homogeneous appearance very very characteristic of a seminoma and what about the microscopy this is what it's going to look like tumor cells are in these lobules these lobules of tumor cells are present who divides them this blue color septa in between the blue color septa in between so for example i've got you three lobules of tumor cells who is dividing them one lobule then second lobule then third lobule who is dividing them the septa is dividing them who has what is there in between the septa this septa has a lot of cells lymphocytes and plasma cells that's the description if examiner doesn't give you the image he'll give you this description that you have the presence of lobules they are separated by fibrous septa and fibrous septa have the presence of lymphocytes and plasma cells are the cells now tell me look at the cells are the cells pink or are they empty looking white looking all of you say that ma'am they are empty looking yes all of you say that they are looking empty because they are clear cells let me put this in the picture have a look at this you've got number 1 lobule number 2 lobule who is dividing it you can see this septa in between you can see this septa have a look at it again you've got one lobule second lobule of tumor cells and who is dividing it the septa in between do you see all these cells look white white clear cells classical case of seminoma guys so you've learned something cut potato appearance with clear cells with lymphocytes plasma cells classical seminoma last image for the day spotter candida trichomonas hsv actinomyces you've got a, a you know a discharge that you see over here characteristic discharge and you've got a pap smear that you see over here so what is it what is it over here 
So for tomorrow, I've told you two questions. Tomorrow, I'll also ask, be asking you the composition of a pap smear. Tomorrow is one more question I'm leaking out. One I've leaked out, cardiac amyloidosis. One more I'm leaking out, pap smear composition. All of you read and come, okay? Excellent. This is a case of candida. So for candida, I can see that curdy white discharge. Very, very characteristic curdy white discharge. How do I interpret this pap smear? Yes, all of you are right that ma'am, the pap smear is showing me sheesh kebab effect. Sorry for ruining a very favorite dish of many for you. So, um, yes, but we can't help it. That is what candida shows you. So, what is sheesh kebab effect? All of you know candida has pseudo hyphae. So, this is the pseudo hyphae. And these are the pieces of kebabs on top of it. What is it? The epithelial cells, the squamous epithelial cells. So you can see the pseudo hyphae. I'll show you another picture. You can see that in between there will be a pseudo hyphae like this. And all these epithelial cells, like those pieces of kebab, are on top of it. That's the classical sheesh kebab effect. Done with this. Three images also done. So today you've learned sheesh kebab effect. You've learned uh, seminoma also. I hope all of you are clear with this. Moving on, coming to the two mnemonics. So today, I'm going to quickly tell you first, what are the enzymes that are released by Staphylococcus aureus, Staph aureus? How do you learn that? Very simple. In micro, I've always told you, learn everything from the name itself. So if I ask you, what are the enzymes which are released by Staphylococcus? Let's go by the alphabets that Staphylococcus contains. T for thermonuclease. T for thermonuclease and nuclease will remind you of DNA, so DNAs. T for thermonuclease and DNAs. PH for phosphatase. 1C is for catalase and 1C is for coagulase. So remember, T for thermonuclease and DNAs, PH for phosphatase, C for catalase and C for coagulase. These are the enzymes that are released by Staphylococcus. I hope you remember this. So every day I'll be sharing two mnemonics with you, which will help you randomly recall some stuff. So this is one. The second mnemonic for the day is based on two stains. The staining protocol of Gram stain and ZN stain. The staining protocol of Gram stain is come in and stain. See, gram staining is like the bread and butter of microbiology. Basic stain of microbiology and a very simple way is just come in and learn how to stain it. You learn it. So, come in and stain. What all do we have? So, we have crystal violet, in I for in for iodine, A for alcohol or acetone, which is a decolorizer, and S for safranin. So, why am I teaching you this? Because they will tell you to arrange this in a sequence. So, if you even know the mnemonic, you will be able to arrange it in a sequence very well. Come in and stain. Crystal violet, iodine, alcohol, safranin. Come in and stain. Done for gram staining. What about ZN stain or acid fast stain? The last one for the day. Class has asked mnemonic. So, what is it? Number one, we have carbal fusion. Along with that, you apply heat. After that, we have alcohol so you um, alcohol or acid so we can even use a combination we can even use a combination of acid alcohol or only acid uh, usually only acid sulfuric acid is used can you tell me for tb can you tell me for tb what percentage of uh, sulfuric acid is preferred h2so4 everyone knows yes Correct. It is a 20% for TB, 20% for TB. And how much for leprobacillus? For leprobacillus, we have 5%. 5% for leprobacillus. So usually sulfuric acid is used. Also in some books, acid alcohol mixture is said. So both of them come with A. So class has asked mnemonic, carbal fusion, heat, acid or acid alcohol. And either the background can be blue or it can be green. Methylene blue or malachite green. M and M, methylene blue, malachite green. So class has asked mnemonic. Quickly tell me if I don't heat, what is that modification known as? Last question for the day. If I don't heat, what is the modification known as? Everyone remembers the Kinyon stain. 
everyone remembers the kinyon stain the kinyon stain yes that is when i don't use heat uh, dr kaushik okay dr kaushik has also asked us one very valid question that ma'am is there anything for which we use a 1% h2so4 everyone can you tell me any microorganism which is going to stain when i use acid in 1% h2so4 concentration who tells me that does everyone agree that uh, no cardia does everyone agree with no cardia yes okay everyone says that yes so 1% for no cardia definitely okay so that was the end from my side we've done well in time like i said a short session so we are done with it which finishes off our kick start morning i hope all of you are up and awake uh, you know good going and you've got that push for the day which gives you uh, you know that energy to study now so don't take a break immediately get back to your books give it a good 2 to 2 and a half hour of a good stretch of study and then go in for your breakfast okay so guys we'll be meeting again at 5:30 today and that will be a general pathology mixed bag quiz with your very favorite leader board that all of you are very very fond of so yes it will be a quiz with a 30 second timer and obviously we'll be discussing it also thank you so much guys thanks a lot for joining in today at 5:30 and tomorrow morning alarm again for 8 o'clock when we discuss i've told you two questions already ready one i'll be asking you pap stain um, composition i'll be asking you question something to do with cardiac amyloidosis and the rest is a surprise thank you all for joining in have a nice day study well and revise well 